I can see a good sized field. It's kind of golden yellow. Something's not right. Bless me. Bless me. Bless me. He has adored her from a distance for quite some time. He wants control. Moving water and I'm being drawn in the direction of that water. And I feel something is really wrong. These are the true stories of real cases and the psychics who help investigators solve their most baffling mysteries. S-10-4, I'm in route. I had received a call from Central Dispatch that a farmer in the community of Port Royal Park had discovered a body on his farm. At the time of the call, we can, uh, was unaware whether it was a homicide, suicide, accidental death. It was determined that the victim was a white female, 18 to 24 years of age. There was no identification found on the body. The crime scene had deteriorated to the point that uh, a cause and manner of death was something that would have to be determined by the medical examiner. We searched the crime scene for a murder weapon, but no weapon was found. The most significant piece of evidence that was discovered was a fiber, a blue fiber, that was found on the clothing of the victim. Police send the fiber to the lab and the body to the medical examiner's office for identification. When we compared the victim's dental records with those on file, we were able to identify this person as Jamie Maribel. Miss Maribel was a 19-year-old girl who had disappeared three days before at Clarksville, Tennessee. We found a very distinctive injury in one of the bones in her neck. It was in the shape of a six-pointed star. One of our colleagues immediately recognized it. He ran out to his truck, came back into the morgue carrying his torque screwdriver. He rammed it into the wall. And we were then immediately able to make the comparison between the mark he made with the mark on Miss Maribel's neck. The fatal injury was caused by a torque screwdriver. Jamie Maribel has been murdered. Police retrace Jamie's steps the night of her disappearance and discover that she was last seen at the bar, the Golden Jukebox. Everyone who was at the bar the night of Jamie Marable's disappearance uh, was interviewed. Police quickly get their first lead. Jamie had received a phone call that her cousin had been involved in an automobile accident. Friends believed that she was headed to the hospital but Jamie never made it to the hospital. Those sort of things didn't happen around here. That was big city crime. It was unheard of for a young woman to go out and uh, be attacked in such a way. But for days, police are unable to identify a suspect. Jamie's father was very involved with the homicide case. At that time, he was a police officer with the Metropolitan Police Department in Nashville, Tennessee. I've got a 19-year-old child being murdered, you know, the case is not solved. So I kept on doing things I thought to keep that case active, but to keep that case in the public's eyes. I went to any length, any avenues, any suggestions, 
and the amount of money I had to spend. I, I didn't turn any ideas down. I, I did everything possible to solve that murder. I remember him calling me on weekends, in the middle of the night, during holidays, and just saying, I want to tell you about Jamie. And, you know, a lot of people started to question Jim's sanity, I guess, because uh, it looked hopeless from where everybody else stood. I rented a billboard to advertise Jamie's murder. Uh, I guess the billboard was up probably a month, and I received a call. The guy asked me, was I interested in, in talking to a psychic? Psychic Nancy Meyer has worked over 500 homicide and missing persons investigations. The first time I heard about Nancy Myers, I uh, did a little research. I knew that she had worked with other law enforcement agencies through, throughout the United States. I was uh, ready to do it right then and there. When I first had contact with Jim Marable and the case, it was kind of stalled out. They did not know what to do next. I gave Nancy some pictures of Jamie. The photographs are like, a, a, they start the movie running. Each object that I hold changes the pictures. Uh, I begin to experience what the victim experienced. The present is gone, and I am there the night the murder happened. I have the sense of her being in a tremendous rush. She's really hurrying. She seems, she seems to be, to be searching, searching for someone. someone. It's dark. It's so oddly quiet. She's really isolated and alone. Someone's watching her. Psychic Nancy Meyer has received photographs of murder victim Jamie Marable. Hi, Jim. This is uh, Nancy Meyer. I got your package, and you know, it's really useful stuff. Yeah, I'm getting a lot of uh, good impressions from the, particularly this photo of the two young ladies. Yes, there definitely was someone watching her that night. I see a truck. It sounds like that engine's more powerful than usual. I can sense high tension wires. It just sends a charge through my body. And in the back of that truck, when they hit the bump stuff, jounces, the noises are metallic. There's tools. I'm hearing stones thrown up. It's not a paved through country lane. I can smell pine. A wooded area. Moving water. He stopped, he stopped this, this truck, truck in the middle of nowhere. And the engine's the idling, idling, but the, the truck, truck has stopped. stopped. What she was telling me, I thought I was reliving a crime scene because she was describing almost verbatim where Jamie's body was found. Electrical towers to run him water. With Jamie being in some woods, she almost described it perfectly. There's an argument. I'm feeling a tremendous amount of fear in her. There's a weapon involved. Glen of metal. I'm seeing a, a long, narrow metal shaft. Neither side is sharp, and the sharpness is at the point. She's fighting for her life. It's not a blade, it's a tool. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I don't know how she would have known about it. None of the investigators ever came out and said Jamie was stabbed with a screwdriver. 
publicly. I felt like maybe, maybe the information that she is to give me would help in solving that case. Nancy Meyer agrees to visit the last place Jamie was seen alive to see if she can pick up on any clues to the killer's identity. For me, there is a very large difference, sometimes a vast difference, between what I get from photographs and what I get from a crime scene. I can see Jamie. There's someone watching her in that parking lot. She's getting into the truck. She's making a terrible mistake. He's really dangerous. She's not afraid of him. She should be, but she's not. They have very muscular hands, and they're rough looking. Grace or Motorola, the hands of a man that does manual labor. He wants control over Jamie. They were supposed, they were supposed to, go to go to the hospital. hospital. Where's, Where's he, he taking, taking her? He's trying to grab her. Who are you? She knows him. She told me that Jamie left a bar with somebody she knew. Jim Marable turns his attention to Jamie's high school friends and makes an unsettling discovery. One of the rumors in Clarksville, Jamie was involved with a guy named uh, uh, Snake Frazier. Snake had a, a lengthy criminal record in Clarksville, Montgomery County, and uh, he had been in uh, penitentiary several times. Uh, his rap sheet probably, I'd say at least two feet long. He was brought in and questioned. Snake tells police he was in Nashville over 60 miles away the night Jamie Marable disappeared. He took a polygraph. He cleared himself. It was just a red herring, just a rumor. That's all it was. No way was Snake Fraser involved in Jamie's murder. Police are back at square one. And then, a break. Analysis of the blue fiber recovered from the crime scene reveals just the clue investigators are searching for. After months of searching, police finally have a lead in their hunt for Jamie Marable's killer. The fiber found on Jamie Marable's clothing was determined to be a carpet fiber from a Chevrolet Silverado truck. Yet police face a daunting task. The carpet fiber was used in approximately 15,000 pickup trucks in this region of the United States. It was literally impossible for any investigative agency to track down those 15,000 trucks. There would be no way to find all of those trucks and do a comparison. In an effort to generate new leads, Jim Marable takes psychic Nancy Meyer to the park where Jamie's body was found. There's the electrical towers that you were describing. Those yeah. power lines. The big ones, yeah. It's exactly what I was visualizing. When I'm working with people and we are approaching uh, a location of a terrible event, uh, I feel it. It actually makes me physically sick. The impact emotionally on the environment of an event like this is very powerful, even years after it's happened. And this is a historical park that we're standing on right now. And over there is where Jamie's body was found. Right over there. Right over there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The 
he knows this area well. He's been here many times. I hear that rumbling again. It's a different location. It's like a slide changing in my mind. I see a bar. He's inside it. He likes to drink. And when he drinks, he's violent. He's gonna brag about this murder. Someone will come forward with information. I can see a small place that is his home. Narrow and long. I hear barking. I can see a dog. It's a trailer. I really feel like he knows the area very well and lives and works near this area. This is not an extraneous choice. He lives and works near here. Jim searches for a white trailer near the park, but without a specific address, the search is futile. The case goes cold. For several years, there are no new leads. Then, out of the blue, a call comes in. Around six years after Jamie was murdered, I got a phone call. A man came forward and said that he knew something about Jamie's murder. Have police finally got the break they've been looking for? Six years after Jamie Marable's murder, a witness comes forward with information. The caller had been threatened by a man named Brian Willis. I would say that Mr. Willis is a very intimidating person. Brian was about 300 pounds. He's a big guy in a little town. He worked for a company called Greenfield Trucking uh, and Construction. They were doing a road project that Brian was working on in the very area where Jamie's body was found. This witness told a fellow that he had worked for that he had had a disagreement with Brian Willis. So Brian Willis had said to him, words to the effect, you better not mess with me or I'll stab your guts out like I did that girl from Clarksville. Police immediately set out to question Brian Willis. Brian Willis was staying in a white trailer, and there was a dog there. Exactly as Nancy Meyer had described in her vision. He admitted that he was at the Golden Jukebox that night. We think they knew each other through the uh, nightlife bar scene, if you will, in Clarksville. One of Jamie's friends said that she thought that Brian had a crush on Jamie. One look at Brian Willis's truck will close the case. Brian Willis drove a Silverado Chevy blue truck, 1983 or 1984. The exact type of truck that police have been looking for. They took a sample of carpet from his truck. The carpet fibers are sent to the lab to be compared to the fiber found on Jamie Marable's clothing. The final conclusion by the FBI laboratory was that the fiber found on Jamie Marable's clothing was a match to the carpet standard taken from the pickup truck belonging to Brian Willis. Brian Willis is indicted for the murder of Jamie Marable. We, the jury, found a defendant, Leslie Brian Willis, guilty of second-degree murder. When he heard the verdict, he casually got up from his chair, started walking around the corner, and then he went berserk. He was threatening everybody in the courtroom. He was threatening me. He was screaming at the judge. And he was just acting like a crazy person. He was convicted of second-degree murder and given 25 years.
But if you put a really good psychic together with modern forensics and really good detectives, the killers in that town better look out. I would strongly recommend that if somebody has an unsolved crime in their family, they contact Nancy Myers and see if she can assist them like she helped us.